All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get the sign-in sheet passed around. Um, now, I figure what I will do is I just handed you all back homework number two, and I figure I'll go ahead and give you all uh, the solution to that homework. Oh. Um, let me go ahead and pass this out, and we'll talk about it. Um, I think all in all, for the most part, you all did very well, so I'm not too concerned about it, but I figured I would at least walk through it a little so you all know what's going on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Um, So one thing I'll point out is this was a correction I provided for, for the last problem. You needed that height of the beam in order to do the derivation, but we'll get to that here in a little bit. Problem number one, I think for the most part this was pretty simple. It was fairly plug and chug just from the problem you had previously done. Um, calculate the cracking moment. I really don't think that there was too big of a deal on that. Now, Problem number two, I'll go ahead and say uh, again that the, the method for computing moment of inertia is probably a little verbose for a problem like this. However, I, I, I do like it because um, it's a pretty standard uh, methodical approach. Um, you, if you know this uh, approach, you can do it for anything. Um, I know a lot of bridge engineers, they'll write uh, Excel spreadsheets to compute uh, section properties of things like plate girders, and it's the same thing. So that's why I, I tend to enjoy it. I do happen to be a bridge engineer, so it's what I do. Um, pretty straightforward. The, the, the complicated portion of this problem was the, uh, the moment of inertia, but once you get past that, it's not very, uh, not very complicated. Now, you needed to do a little bit of structural analysis uh, indicating if you have a beam with a uniformly distributed load on it, what can you apply to that beam uh, until you cause cracking? Well, it's WL squared over 8 to get, the, uh, to get the moment. So solving for the cracking load, you know, you just rearrange that equation and solve for W. It takes 0.535 kips per foot to cause cracking in that beam. However, the beam is already subjected 2.192 kips per foot because what load are all beams subjected to? Their own self weight. So if it's already subjected to 0.192 and it requires 0.535 to cause cracking, how much can I actually physically put on the beam? The difference of those two. So that's where the answer of 0.343 kips per foot comes into play. Um, problem three, uh, you're to assume that the beam is uh, cracked, so you do a transform section analysis. This should be fairly straightforward from what you all have done before. Again, same methodical approach to calculate moment of inertia. Um, once you've got your moment of inertia, it really is pretty straightforward. One thing I'll point out, and um, this is probably going to cause me in future years to develop my own beam design aids in regards to multiples of rebar. What you find is if you go into that beam design chart I gave you where you know you look up four number eights or, or, or what have you. It'll say something like 3.14, but if you take the area of a single number eight and multiply it by four, you'll get 3.16. And the difference is rounding because you're talking about the area of a circle and Excel charts will do the calculations to 12 decimal places or whatever anyways. So I might develop my own so that that rounding issue kind of goes away because you might, these answers might be slightly different than yours if you use like 3.14 instead of 3.16 or, or, or what have you. So, but all in all, the, metho the methodology blah, is the same. Problem four, I don't think there was a big issue. I uh, just calculate them in. Uh, it's about as simple as it could get. Problem five, okay, this is the different one. I wanted you all to have some experience with a different geometry because of what we're doing today and what, because of what comes next. When we look at T-beams and L-beams and flanged sections, okay? So, a couple things to point out. Just because the beam is triangular does not mean we do not assume a 
uniform stress block. It is still a uniform stress of 0.85 Fc prime. It is still over a depth of A, but your compressive force is not 0.85 Fc prime AB because it's not a rectangle, it's a triangle. So the first thing you need to do is to calculate the area of this triangle, you need the height of the triangle, which is A, and you need the width of the triangle, which you don't know. But given the, uh, the geometry of the beam, you can say, well, if I zoom in and look at this little stress block and sort of blow it up, well, it's a depth of A and it's some width of W. I don't know what that width is, but I can say, well, essentially, B is to H as W is to A and calculate that accordingly to sort of rearrange it uh, in terms of the terms that you do know or the terms that you want to know. Calculate the area of the stress block, one half of base times height and you get A squared B over 2H and now you can do compression equals tension. So equilibrium, the compressive force is 0.85 FC prime times the area of your stress block which that's just all the alphabet soup that goes into that. The tensile force is still ASFY, so compression has to equal tension. Set this equal to that, solve for A, and that's what you get. Pretty straightforward. As for the moment capacity, all I re really am looking for or was looking for was this. Um, MN is ASFY times the moment arm. The moment arm is not D minus A over 2, it's D minus 2A over 3, or 2 thirds of A. Why 2 thirds instead of 1 half? It's a triangle. The centroid of a triangle is 2 thirds from the top. And that's it. Questions? Okay. Before we get into the lecture, um, a couple things. Did everybody get a solution? Okay. Oh, right here. We got time. Another question. Um, Homework number three, which is due on Monday. Where are we at? Have you all started it? Looked at it? It's a big homework. I'm not going to lie to you. So um, if you haven't started on it, um, uh, medically, probably the amount of caffeine is not a good thing. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay, okay, so to be clear, okay, I want everybody to listen to the words that, that are coming out of my mouth because this is important. All right. Um, the book in their design problems will suggest that you use certain row values. They'll say things like use the row that's equivalent to 0 .0075 of the strain or use the row that's uh, equivalent to row balanced or the half of row balanced. Look, the purpose for that is, is as follows. Let me go back to example five, the problem that will never die. Okay, this was example five and I want, I want everybody to pay attention to this. This is really important, okay? Step one is you needed to compute the moments on the beam. You needed to make an assumption as to what the beam looked like. So we assumed an H value, assumed a B value, went on with our work. We calculated a required MN and we calculated a row design. Now, for our examples and everything that we've been doing so far where you didn't know the cross section, we assumed 0.18 FC prime over FY. That is a perfectly valid assumption. There are also other values you can use for row. That's not the only one. Personally, I think it's the simplest one to use. But the book will say things like use the row corresponding to a strain of 0 .0075, whatever. Look, my advice to you, just use that, okay? That's fine, that's fine. Look, and also let me enhance a little bit of relaxation in, in your worry about the grades because I know you're probably worried about that. Look, there are probably six or seven different methodical answers to these problems that are all correct, okay? I'm almost certain that not everybody will get the same beam design. That does not mean that you're wrong, okay? This is what's probably going to happen, okay? I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna get some homeworks back and there's gonna be six or seven different beam designs, okay? As long as we can follow your math, you get a beam design that makes sense, that meets specifications, and has a relatively strong efficiency, 
That's fine. Okay? So that's all we're asking. Okay? It, what's this, if its efficiency is good and it meets ACI requirements? Yeah, that's fine. The answer that I got is not the same. That's fine. That's totally fine. Look, when I did my solution, I'll go ahead and tell you this. When I did my solution, um, and, and Logan and I were, were talking about uh, some of our resulting answers, he got like a, a 96, 97% efficiency on, it was like 97% on problem two, and I, I got 96.4. So his beam is a little more efficient, and that's totally fine, okay? He used a different row value than I did, so that's where he got that, okay? My problem three, my efficiency was like 99.1. Okay. You might get one that's better, worse. If you're in that 90s range, and again, you meet FEMN greater than or equal to MU, you have a strain uh, uh, greater than 0 .004, and your area of seal is greater than ASMIN, I don't care what it looks like. As long as you have a methodical procedure towards your design. Okay? It's open-ended. I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> it, in all honesty, your efficiency should be in the 90s. It really should be. Okay. I used 0.18 FC prime over FY, and I got 94.6. Like I literally used this row value for design. That's what I used, and I got about 90. It was either 94.6 or 96.4. I, I can't remember. This, the row, okay, the row value is the ratio of how much steel you have to how much concrete you have. And, and I'll be honest, the amount of steel that you throw into a beam, it, it's more sensitive than you would think. And you all are finding that out the hard way. One, one piece of advice I would give you is I, I, I know I'm going to hear it. You're like, well, we can't use Excel on the exam. I understand that. But... Throwing a few calcs into Excel and quickly changing some values will make your life a lot easier on a homework assignment like this. I'm just telling you. And it's not like you're not doing anything different. You're still calculating values. All Excel is doing is doing them faster for you. I mean, just because you can't use Excel on an exam doesn't mean you shouldn't use it on this homework. I'm just saying. Again, it's design. It's a little open-ended. I expect different answers. That's okay. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll, one thing I will say, though. We shouldn't get uh, different answers on problem four. Problem four is the slab design. And on problem number four, we're using the minimum slab height, which is identical to the procedure we did in class. So if you get a different answer on number four, something's, something's wrong, okay? All right, anybody have any questions? All right, one quick thing to point out. Um, so Mr. Pava actually pointed this out. Uh, I did make a little mistake on our schedule. Um, oh, wrong thing. Um, I forgot to change the, uh, the dates here. Like the topics and the, everything was correct here, but I had like the 15th over again or something like that. Um, Again, your homework is due on the 22nd, okay? Now, what I would really like to do is get the homework graded back to you on the 24th. I can probably guarantee that's not going to happen. This is going to be a pretty tough assignment to grade, okay? So, at the very least, you will get the solution back on the 24th. Now, I have no problem giving you the solution earlier than that and giving it to you on the 22nd when it's due. But if I do that, I'm not accepting any late work, so... It's, I mean, whatever you all want to do. But we will have our exam on Friday. All right. Any questions? Maybe. No, 10 o'clock, yes. This one's not as bad for a time cruncher. I can tell you that. This one's not as bad. Yes. No. 
We've already missed a, a fair amount of time with the weather and with me being gone on Wednesday. We've got to start getting back to it. All right, all right. Are we good? Okay, now. If that's the case, let's actually start getting back to a little bit of uh, stuff uh, involving reinforced concrete. Now, last time where we left off was we were looking at the concept of T-beams. We really didn't do much with them, so this is actually a, a good example to, to be involved in or to get started with. Okay, so let me get my little clicker here. Okay. Now, the first thing I want you all to, to understand is uh, what a T-beam is and where we see it. And we see it when we cast beams and slabs together, which is very common. You have this sort of rib section sticking out, which will be the, 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 the beam, and then a portion of that slab is considered effective in that beam's capacity, and that's the T-beam that we're looking at. So internal beams in a given slab system we would call T-beams. The ones on the end would be our L-beams, if you will. I tend to try and refer to them as flanged sections, sections where you have a really wide top and bottom, but a really narrow middle. Um, Mr. Eukonik asked a question earlier on about box beams. This is the same philosophy. You have a really large flange, but then you have two thin webs. It's no different. A box beam and a T-beam are analyzed the exact same way. The only difference is, instead of dealing with a single BW, you have half a BW here, half a BW there. It's the same thing. Now, it's not as simple if you're dealing with something like that's pre-stressed, but then again, pre-stressed is a whole other can of worms. <laughs> that, that's, we'll try and talk about that near the end. Um, okay, so a couple things on terminology. So, real quick, um, before when we, remember that uh, minimum area of steel requirement? I said there was that B sub W. I said, for now, let's just say B sub W is the width of the beam. Now we have two different variables. This B, the width of the flange, and B sub W, the width of the web. Okay. Now we have H is the height of the whole beam. H sub F is the height of the flange. We still have D being the depth from the top to the rebar. Everybody okay with that in terms of terminology? All right. Now, if you actually go through and look at stresses in the slab as you start to bend, bend the beam, what happens is you've got these really large stresses right near the beam, but as you get away from the beam, the stresses in the slab, they, they, they kind of tend to dissipate a little bit. So one of the questions you have to ask is, for a given slab, how much of that slab is effective for that individual beam? And we slice out a little bit of it and say, that's our effective flange width. Okay? Now, you would think that, let's just use the tributary width. That's not necessarily the case in concrete design. You might have a tributary width of, I don't know, 10 feet, but you might only use 5 feet as the effective flange width. They are two different values. Okay? It's possible that they're the same, but that's um, purely by coincidence. Okay? For T-beams, we take our effective flange width as the minimum of these three values, the length over four, the girder spacing, or the web width plus 16 flange thicknesses. Um, it's pretty plug and chug. For L-beams, the limits are a little different, but in the end it's the same philosophy. Okay, again, L-beams are the ones on the end. The complicated issue, however, with, uh, with these types of sections is trying to figure out the depth of your stress block. See, because of that, we have two different types of classifications. We have what's called a rectangular T-beam and a true T-beam. In other words, a rectangular T-beam is one where the stress block is inside the flange. And the question you have to ask is, is this, this beam right here, is this beam really any different than this beam? Okay? I mean, think. If for this beam, you would have a rectangular stress block and a lump of steel at the bottom. If we're talking about this beam up top, it's a rectangular stress block, lump of steel at the bottom. It really behaves no differently 
than a rectangular beam. That's why we call it a rectangular T-beam. A true T-beam, however, has the stress block buried in the web. And now our stress block is T-shaped. So it actually does behave like a T-beam. The difference between these two is how we calculate MN. It ain't so simple, okay? It's not complicated, I, I guess I should say, but you just got to make sure your bookkeeping, sorry, your bookkeeping is on. Everybody good? Okay. So with that, I want to do, do uh, a couple of examples, okay? So before we get into this, let's look at a couple of examples. Is there something missing from this diagram right here? Is there a dimension I did not give you? The width of the, the top, right? I didn't give you B because we got to compute it for this problem. So for this problem, we have 4 KSI concrete, 60 KSI steel. We have uh, a beam that is 30 foot long. The clear distance between the webs is 50 inches. And from that, we need to compute the capacity of this T-beam. Yes? We haven't even started the problem yet. One of the seven virtues is patience. We'll get there, I promise. We'll get there. Believe in me, I promise. All right. Okay. We'll get, I, to answer your question, we will get there. It, it, you will see here in a second, and you'll go, oh, I get it now. I, I promise. Uh. Okay. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is actually like uh, draw this beam out a little bit so that you all actually have a little bit of a clearer understanding as to what it is we're actually looking at. Okay, So you all have the dimensions of the beam in front of you, so I think I can clear this up a little bit. What I want to do is actually draw the floor system. Now, before I draw this floor system, just real quick, how long is it? 30 feet which is 360 inches. Everybody all right with that? Now, what we're talking about here is a floor system that continues on. In other words, I've got a slab about like this, and then I've got That's good enough. So what I've done is I've picked out a couple beams uh, just to illustrate this. And this floor system goes on, you know, in and out, you know. Something about like that, right? Make sense? Okay, now, let's, let's illustrate a couple of dimensions. Let's see if we can clear some of this up, okay? What is this dimension right here? It is H sub F. And what is H sub F? Four inches. Okay. Now, each of these beams contains... six number nines, right? Maybe I'll put what is the area of steel? What's the area of a number nine? One square inch. 
so six inches squared. Everybody all right with that? Okay, now, let's see. Let's clear a couple things up. All right, so this dimension right here, is b sub w, and it is 10 inches. Now, maybe I'll actually erase some of this. Okay. Can somebody tell me what that dimension is, the dimension from here to here? 50 inches, the clear distance between webs. So, if I had to determine a girder spacing, S, S would be what? There we go. There's something to be said about just straight dimensional analysis. Make sure you understand what's going on with the dimensions. Now, this dimension from the top of the section to the center of that steel, we call that dimension D, and for this beam it is 24. Now, what we are after, however, is this. We want to know for a given beam, let's say we're looking at the beam in the middle, I want to know that. What's that? All right, that's a good question. Wouldn't it be 60? The answer is no. Generally, B is taken as the minimum of Again, it's not as simple as tributary width, okay? Well, the bridge specification says it is. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and look into my crystal ball a little bit. For this problem, it does happen to be 60 inches. But I want to be very clear that there is a difference between tributary width and effective flange width. Everybody all right with that? Now, if you go through and plug and chug, what do we have on top? We have 360 inches divided by 4. We have 10 inches plus 16 times 4 inches. And we have 60 inches. And what do we have? We have 90 inches. 16 times 4 is 64 plus 10 is 74 and 60 and we have that That's a great question. The answer is it's, it's ineffective for the beam. That doesn't mean that when you design that portion as a slab, and it's still going to see load, what my, my, my answer to that would be you would design this as if it was a slab, you know, a 12-inch strip, and then figure out how much reinforcement needs to go there. But when you're assessing that beam, it's possible you're right, that you could have an effective flange width here, an effective flange width here, and there's a little chunk that's ineffective for the beams. That doesn't mean it doesn't see load. That's where your slab design comes into play. That's a, that's a great question. Well, yeah, but then you're throwing more beams into it. You see what I mean? And, and that's a, that is a, a loaded question because 
it, it, it's, it's basically just physics, okay? If you want smaller beams in a system, you tend to need more of them. So there's a balancing point between, you know, if your girder spacing gets too large, your beams get too massive. They get too deep architecturally, it doesn't make any sense. If they get too close together, you have too many of them. So there's a, there's a balancing point. And that's, that's where engineering comes into play, where you've actually got to make, you know, the, the proper engineering judgment. Those are, that, that is a great question. Everybody good so far? Okay. Now, okay. All right. So what we're going to do now is determine the location of the neutral axis. And I'm going to write it out From here on out, I'm going to abbreviate it as NA so that when you all see me write NA, what does NA mean? It means neutral axis. Okay. Um, now, ignore the T-beam, ignore the geometry. When you're dealing with a concrete beam, how do we determine the depth of the stress block? We have to use what relationship? Equilibrium, right? What does equilibrium say for reinforced concrete beams? That the force is in... Okay, the forces in the concrete equal the forces in the steel. That's true for now. I, I, in more general terms, the compression equals the tension. The reason why I make that distinction is because after this, we're going to look at doubly reinforced beams where you actually have rebar in compression. So, just for later, okay? Uh, but you are correct. Compressive forces equal tensile forces. So C equals T. Okay. First off, let's keep it simple. Okay. What is our um, tensile force? ASFY. What is our compressive force? Well, we don't know that yet because the geometry is a little funky, right? Now. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say that my compressive force is 0 0.85 FC prime times the area in compression, whatever area is in compression. And I'm going to say that that equals ASFY. Bless you. All right. Everybody okay with this so far? Okay. So would you agree that the area in compression is that? Just divide both sides. All right. So AS is six square inches. Sixty KSI. And we get we get that. I'll give you all a moment. How are we doing? So far so good? All right, now, Mr. Yukonik asked a question about how do you know whether or not it's a rectangular T-beam or a true T-beam. I'm about to answer that question. Can I go ahead and move on to the next slide? Now, what did you just say? The area of the flange? You are exactly correct. So, the area in compression was... 105.88 inches squared. What, how do you calculate the area of the flange? Now, 
right? B times the thickness, right? So that is, what is B? We calculate that to be. 60 inches. And what is the flange thickness? All right. Does that make sense? So, all right. What does this observation mean? It means two things. The NA and because of that we are dealing with a rectangular T-beam. Because, here's what's going on. Like here's your T-beam Okay, we've got our steel in, com in tension, and then my compression, okay? Think about this. How much area is in compression? 105.88, but how much area is in the flange? About 240. So what we're saying is that my compressive area probably looks a little something about like this. where this dimension, what do we call that dimension? A, that's the depth of the stress block A. Okay. That depth A is less than four inches, right? Isn't that what that means? That depth better be less than four inches. So how do you calculate A for a rectangular beam? For a rectangular beam, A is ASFY over 0 0.85 FC prime B, right? That's what we've been doing for rectangular beams. And what do we have? We have 6 inches squared. And I think by now you're going to see this problem is going to be pretty rote at this point. And what's B? Plug and chug and you get 1.765 inches. Does that answer make sense? It better, it better be less than 4 inches, right? So MN is ASFY D minus A over 2, which is 6 point, oh goodness, pen's getting away from me. And then we have 60 KSI. What's D? Now, before I start calculating this out, what's it gonna, what are the units going to be for this mo nominal moment capacity? Kips times, it's a moment, inch kips, right? So why don't I go ahead and just say one foot over 12 inches and divide the whole thing by 12 right now. Plug and chug and you get 693. 0.5 point foot kips. Now, is that the design capacity of this section? What is the design capacity of this section? Phi M N. What's phi? What does phi depend on? Depends on the strain in the steel. Got to calculate the strain. Now it probably will be 0.9, but in concrete design, what is phi? It depends. That's the answer. 
I can tell some of y'all haven't done problem one on, on the homework for problem three. Because if you did phi is 0.9 on problem one on the homework, that's not right. <laughs> now, where do we start? You tell me, where do we start? C, okay, we need that neutral axis step to the, where the strain equals zero, and that's A over beta one. So, 1.765 over beta sub one. What's beta sub one for four KSI concrete? 0.85. Again, that number is not the same. It's not the same variable as this. It happens to be the same value, but that's by coincidence. All right, so plug and chug and you get 2.076 and then we calculate the strain in the steel and how do we calculate that? Times what? There we go. That's D minus C over C. All right. D is what, 24 inches minus 2.076, excuse me, and you're going to get 0 0.03168. What does that mean? It, now it's 0.9 because this value has to be bigger than 0 0.005 for it to be 0.9. That's way bigger than 0 0.005. So therefore, phi is 0.9. So, I'll ask this again. If you're dealing with reinforced concrete beams, what is phi? Depends. There we go. That's the answer. And it depends on what? The strain in the steel. There we go. Yes. Yes. And I'll, I'll put greater than 0 0.005. That's the ACI absolute minimum cap on the strain in the steel, which look at problem one, it may pass, it may fail. That's fine, okay? If it fails, it probably means you either put, it probably means you put too much steel in the beam, or your beam is proportioned very oddly, which, to be honest, on problem one on the homework, it is really odd. It's a really wide beam. It's, it's, it's a strange section, so. Okay. So therefore, phi mn is 0 0.9 times 693.5 foot kips. Phi mn is 624.2. What do you think? So, any of you with any latent precognitive abilities or psychic powers, what do you think is going to happen on example 8B? It's not going to be rectangular. It's not going to be in the flange. Man. Some of you also try some palm readings or, or break out the tarot cards or start scrying or something. <laughs> okay. 
We're not going to complete this example, but I at least want to make a couple points about it. So in this example, we're going to compute the capacity of the T-beam. There's a couple things that are simplified about this example. For instance, you were given the effective flange width because, you I mean, it's, it's really plug and chug. I didn't really see the point in doing it again. Um, we're going to compute the capacity of this T-beam again, but we're going to find some different answers. Okay? Yes? That and just the, the general proportions of the beam in general. Like in this beam, for instance, the web is much wider. It's 14 inches as opposed to 10 inches. And then, uh, let's see, it's 30 inches effective depth versus 24 inches of effective depth. The, and, and the area also is different. It's not one particular parameter. It's a lot of them. Now, I will say this. On the last problem, if we put less steel or no, if we put more steel in there, that probably would, would change it up a little bit. But then it, it would also change other things. I mean, we might change the, uh, the fee value or the strain in the steel altogether. So it, it's not as simple as that. There, there's a few more parameters that go into it. Yeah. Now, does, do FC prime and, and FY affect it? You bet. But those are very typical values. Um, what might be interesting to see is what happens if FC prime is 3 KSI as opposed to 4 KSI. Or what if it's 2 KSI, or higher, what if it's 6 or 8. Um, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I want to take a moment and just discuss this example, um, but we'll start it next time. One thing to point out, so our effective flange width is much thinner. It was 60 inches on the last problem, it's 30 inches here. What we're going to find is we're going to make sort of a blanket assumption in the beginning and assume, you know, okay, it's rectangular. And if you were to, well, let's put it like this. If you calculate the, air, the required area in compression for this beam, it comes out to be about 178 square inches, but the flange is only 120 inches. So that means that the neutral axis is somewhere about right here. Hence, we have a true T-beam. And with a true T-beam, we, we have to be a little careful with it about how we compute the, the section. So that's pretty much all I have for you all um, today. Um, again, if you haven't started that homework, um, medically I do not recommend the amount of caffeine, but you're going to be pulling some late nights. I do recommend Excel to try and streamline some of the counts. Um, with that, that's all I got, guys. Y'all have a great weekend.